What is up, my people? Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church's Sermon Spotlight, where we are coming at you each and every week with a fresh service to debrief an effort to send biblical truth. What better way to do that than by the power of conversation? I'm Mark Francis, once again in the host seat. Well, we congratulate um, a couple different people these days with babies, Caleb and Hannah, mm-hmm. baby Charlie. And we also have Jeremy and Abby Lindenberg had their baby as well. So, man, two of our Sermon Spotlight hosts. Baby, baby Gabriel. Are, uh, having baby babies. Yeah, baby yeah. Gabriel. Yeah. So, Rose, welcome back. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for thanks for being willing to sit here. Oh, we love course. it. I, I love it. This is a great this is a great sermon series and I, I love talking about it. It is. So. I'm there's a buzz, I believe, about this Christology series. Hmm. And Mark, you were at the center of it. So we appreciate you being here. Well, hopefully to, Jesus is. No, of course, <laughs> of course. But just the idea that like, yeah, we need to focus on this. And yeah. just the conversations that I've been having that I hear uh, here in the staff and even amongst community groups and our congregation already of just this idea of beholding him and, um, and just fixating our eyes on him is going to be such a key concept here leading to Christmas. It's going to be really cool. So I'm yeah. excited about it. And so we're in week two um, of diving into this idea. And Mark, you dug into the deity of Christ yeah. and wanted to hear more of your thoughts because I know there's probably even a lot on the cutting room floor. So, yeah, I mean, like I've said, whole books are written about the deity of Christ. We were just talking uh, off camera about Lee Strobel's, you know, the case for Christ. And mm-hmm. uh, he's dealt with a lot of those and written a lot, a lot of apologists, apologetic works on, on that topic of the deity of Christ. And it's, I had some questions raised already thinking about, well, how does that tie in, you know, the humanity of Christ? And so next week we'll, mm-hmm. I'll be talking uh, again, generally uh, on the, that issue of the humanity of Christ. Um, so it does, um, it does raise uh, questions and, and there's a lot more that can be said than, than um, certainly was said uh, on a weekend. Uh, about that, so in this podcast, I, I do want to talk a little bit, uh, a little bit more on some biblical connecting of dots. Hmm. Uh, that was part of what I wanted to do in the message, especially with say Psalm uh, 107, and there was also Psalm 65 and 79 that talked about semen and 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 God Jehovah hmm. calming the seas. But Psalm 107 was so clear. Um, that he spoke hush and it was still. And I do think, um, I don't think it's hard to, to um, imagine the disciples well aware of Psalm 107, that whole scenario when he said, hush, be still, instantly calm. And that their question of even greater fear was who then is this? Hmm. Because they would have known Psalm 107. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how, how do we connect the dots here about who who is this person in the boat and what he just did and what we know of about Yahweh of, of the Old Testament? And there are numerous um, connections like that. So just for, real quickly for as, as an example, Isaiah 6, when Isaiah preached on the Isaiah a number of years ago, but Isaiah 6, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne lofty and exalted. Um, and that whole scene of the seraphim calling out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. There was this image that, um, Isaiah saw, um, and, and Isaiah continued and, um, you know, he says, you know, woe am I, verse five, I'm done. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then the seraphim touched his lips with the coals and I then heard a voice, um, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, you know, here am I, send me. Um, but then the voice of the Lord said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but you will not perceive, keep on looking, you won't understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise they might see with their eyes, they might hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. And I'm not going to go into the meaning of all that. I just, it's okay. That was Isaiah 6. That took place in the 8th century BC. Isaiah saw the Lord hmm. in this beautiful scene. 
Well, you go to John's gospel and in John chapter 12, interestingly, um, in John chapter 12, um, in verse 37, um, but though it, it's John writes that, but though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. And John concludes in verse 38 by saying, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has, and he quotes from Isaiah with the passage we just read, Lord, who has received um, our, our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And uh, for this reason, um, they could not believe for Isaiah said again, Isaiah or, or verse 40, and then he quotes this Isaiah um, 6 passage. Uh, he has blinded their eyes. He has hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive with their heart and be converted and I heal them. Well, then it says, John writes, these things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and spoke of him. <laughs> Nevertheless, many, even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, mm. for they loved the uh, approval of men, not the approval of God. Well, clearly John is making the connection. Isaiah is talking about Jehovah God. Mm. And I, John says they were talking, Isaiah saw his glory. About Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so there's this really interesting connection that John makes about the God uh, Jehovah of Isaiah's day that he saw, he spoke of him. So there's another example that I could have talked about Sunday as mm. a, you know, talking about the deity of Christ. Mm. John knew, and he was connecting the dots for us. Another quick example is um, uh, Romans chapter 10. And um, He's talking about, uh, again, uh, the context is Christ. Um, verse four, Christ is the end of the law uh, to everyone who believes. And he, he's, so, so the, the, the focal point of this passage is talking about, about the Lord. And verse nine, then Paul writes, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, and, um, you know, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Again, an Isaiah passage. For there's no distinction between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. And then he quotes from Joel. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord, and there it is, Jehovah, mm -hmm. Yahweh, capital, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. How will they call on him whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him without, and so on and so forth. And again, the context is talking about Jesus, mm -hmm. about the Christ. Um, that if you confess with your mouth, that G and I won't go into the, the details of the meaning of all that, but he's just talking about Jesus. And if you, if you call out to Jesus, Lord, just if you confess him, Lord, um, and call upon him, and he quotes that Joel, if you, that the Jesus that you're to call upon him in Romans is the Lord, Jehovah, that Joel was talking about. They're connecting the dots for us. One other example of that is, um, is Philippians, in Philippians chapter 2, and it, this will be a passage we're going to de develop more in this series as the series goes, but Philippians chapter 2 is the great... It's called the great kenosis passage, the emptying passage. Um, and um, talk about Jesus in verse 5, have this attitude which is in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the very form, essence of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. He'd emptied himself. So and I'm not going to develop that now, but later in the series, we're, we're going to talk about that passage. But I want to jump down to verse 9 where it says, for this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Now, interestingly, if we go back to Isaiah, Isaiah 45, um, Jehovah God is talking, um, Isaiah 45, um, verse 21, declare, set forth your case. Um, who has announced this from of old? You know, is it not I, the Lord, Jehovah? There is no other God besides me, a righteous God and a savior. There's none except me. And verse 22 says, turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth for I am God. There is no other. And now verse 23, I have sworn by myself. The word has gone forth from the mouth in righteousness and you will not turn back that to me, every knee will bow. Every tongue will swear allegiance. And they will say of me, only in the Lord are righteousness and strength, and men will come to him, and all who are angry at him shall be put to shame. In the Lord, Jehovah, all the offspring of Israel will be justified and will glory. Well, there it is. Um, every knee will bow, every tongue will swear allegiance to me. And he just says, I am alone. There is no other God beside me. Paul writes and he quotes from that passage that to Jesus Christ, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess him Lord. Yeah, it just reinforces to me. I remember when we went through that Isaiah study, Mark, and you talked about, um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I remember it as clearly in the sermons, but as you talked to the worship planning team, you talked a lot about how the book of Isaiah is the gospel it's in the, the Old fifth Testament, gospel. Right? right? That it's the, the story of Christ present in the Old Testament years before Christ ever was there. Right. And the story of Christ even broader than just he was born of a virgin, you know, lived his life and died, but that he is the deity and that the future glorification of him and all of those things that we see in Isaiah. Yeah. So it's a good yeah, reminder. There, there's, just, there's so many things that if, you, if a person took the time and connected the dots, you, you, you just... The, when Paul wrote these things, uh, the New Testament writers, John write these things, I think they were probably far more astute in Old Testament Jewish scriptures mm. because they were Jews. Mm. We have to do a little digging to make those connections, but... But they're there. They're Praise there. the Lord, they're there. And, and, it's a, and, and it's helpful when John says, this is to fulfill what Isaiah the prophet wrote. It's, well, thanks, because I wouldn't have made that connection, John. Or when Paul says, you know, and, and our translators put it in bold when he quotes from the Old Testament Isaiah, it helps us make those connections. So there, there's, so, there's a wealth of New Testament information that connects those dots. Now, the question might be, and I've read this in, in certain writings about, well, it seems like the New Testament writers were really hesitant to equate Jesus with God. Hmm. So, and we'll talk, I think, next week a little more about this if I have time in the sermon, but that's understandable. I was reading some literature by the Jehovah's Witnesses that, that rightly explain um, that um, that that, um, we're to that that there's only one God, and um, of course they mess it up because of the that they don't understand that the different uh, personhoods. So when we talk about the Trinity, we're talking about one God manifested three distinct persons. So you're writing under the divine inspiration of the New, New Testament. And as you're, as you're writing under inspiration, the Holy Spirit is writing through you and you're, you're writing down what, the, what you're being inspired to write. The challenge for the Holy Spirit is to make mm -hmm. sure that the distinction is made between the three persons of the Trinity. Because Jesus is not God the Father. He's a distinct person. Nor the Holy Spirit. Nor the Holy Spirit is not Jesus nor God the Father, but they're they're still God. So it seems in the New Testament, they will talk about God, the father, but oftentimes that terminology is not attributed to Jesus. He'll be the Lord Jesus. And if you go into the old Testament and 
I, and I don't remember off the top of my head, it's hundreds of times that the, that the personal name for God, Jehovah, when it's translated in the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation around 200 BC, Jewish writers came up with the, the Greek translation of the Old Testament called the Septuagint. The Greek word kurios is used, which is the word Lord for, for God. Mm -hmm. Now that word means simply master, or so you're saying that in the Greek, that when the Septuagint happened, they took Yahweh and just changed it to the word curious. Lord. Is right. that okay? Right, right. And so, um, but the, in the New Testament writers, they're keeping a distinction between the persons of the Godhead. And so there, there's a fine line here. So um, th there, there, there's, there's, there's a few places that I mentioned a few of them, like Titus 2, Romans 9, 5, um, uh, where, where Jesus, Colossians uh, talks about 2, 9, the fullness of deity dwells in him, where um, it's talked about our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. But for the most part, that word God, uh, theos in the New Testament is reserved for God the Father. John writes in John 1, in the beginning was God or was the word and the word was with God. Well, he means God, the father. Um, but the second person of the Trinity is called the word who no, became no. flesh. The word was God. The word was God. Um, but he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet people will say, well, that term Lord can also mean master. Uh, that curios, that Greek word is used for other people besides just mm -hmm. Jehovah God or Jesus. And so that gives people uh, different uh, organizations, cults, the, the kind of the permission to say, well, they didn't, they just meant sir. Mm -hmm. Well, no, when Paul wrote the Lord Jesus, you know, if you could, that, that he is the Lord, he's tying that back into the Septuagint concept of he's Jehovah, Yahweh. There is one God. It's the person of the Son, which is in distinction to God the Father. Right. And to, to, to wrap that back around a little bit, partly because Paul himself understood Jewish scripture so well, he understood things like, hey, in the Psalms, it says that he will calm storms. He calmed storms. That's right. And so he had kind of the cultural and historical knowledge and understanding of what God made flesh on this earth would it's accomplish right. it's and so could do. It's so apparent too that the study of the deity of Christ is just, it goes way beyond the 33 years that he was here mm -hmm. in the earth, that, that you can look at the Old Testament and look at Genesis and then look at the New Testament and where the writers went and look to Revelation, that there's this entire grand picture right. of who Christ is that I, I, goes well beyond just the study of oh, what is what did he do here now in the earth? Right. That maybe people would be debating, is he right. God? And a couple of weeks from now, we'll, I'll be talking about the pre-existence of Jesus. And then Tim Sanford will be preaching on the pre-incarnate, mm. the, the, the Jesus before he took on human flesh. So, so, so again, there's this massive, but, but it can get confusing because the distinct, there still has to remain the distinction between God, the father God the Son and God the Spirit, three distinct persons, one God. And so, yeah, they'll, the, the, even in some of the Jehovah's Witness writings, they'll talk about, well, the, the, obviously Jesus is a different person. He can't be the Father. Exactly. But if you're coming with a, uh, that if you don't understand the Trinity and the breadth of understanding of how that has to all fit, then you can get confused or it can be, you can be right. deceived. Or have, a whole, or have a big whole picture and an understanding. And I think, you know, circling back, I'm so, as, as the listeners are learning more and more, I'm so passionate about art and this idea that, um, that different, the way we write or the way we interpret or the way we hear kind of colors what we have to say. And those authors were writing under divine inspiration, but they were still human beings as well, right? So they still have their, um, what Pers they think is really important. Go ahead. Yeah, their, their person person bleeds ahead. through the, their writings because God didn't usurp their 
backgrounds or everything about right. them as so persons. So I was sharing with these guys, I looked, I was looking at some things about the deity of Christ and um, all of the places where Christ himself says, I am God are in the book of John. And, um, but why should we be surprised at that in a sense? Because how does John start his whole gospel? In the beginning was the word, like words were very important to John, right? right. So what the things Christ said like had a real impact on him. Whereas other writers like Matthew and the whole calming of the storm, which you used in your sermon on Sunday, Mark, like that is referring back to that Psalm. That is God showing himself as master over nature. Right. Right. And so his actions in that case are speaking. I am God. Well, and, and John, to going back to that, you also want to understand to whom was this biblical author writing? Well, and what's the nature of it? Well, it's, uh, he's writing to an unsaved, and, and there's good evidence, an unsaved Jewish audience. So it's a it's a gospel track. These things, John 20, 20, 31, I've written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing. So um, of course, so if you're writing to an unsaved, unbelieving Jewish audience, you're going to talk a lot about I am. Mm-hmm. Right? I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. Mm. The I am statements are mm. going to naturally be found more in John mm -hmm. because he's writing to that audience that would have picked up on that. Now, it would have been blasphemous to them, mm. but <laughs> there's also statements that John writes about where the Pharisees take that head on. Hey, that's blasphemy. Let's pick up stones and stone them because he's making, he's a man making himself equal to be God. Right, John is saying. <laughs> so the debate yes. that people have that aren't believers that say, oh, Jesus never said he was the son of God. It, it, you go straight to John and you oh, have yeah. to have the interpretation, understanding of what I am means. That's right. And <laughs> what he is implying and what he's saying and how the people reacted to that. That's right. It's, it's so apparent. It's, it's not a... It's not a valid debate. No. And and so for people, we go back to the C.S. Lewis quotes. Is he is he a liar? Is he crazy? Or is he God? Yeah. And and he is declaring that he's God through who through his words, through his actions yeah. as well. Um, and and to just come out and say, yeah, I'm God. Here, come look at me. That's 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 not going to win people over as well. No. In fact, of course, I was going to say, you know, that the 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 demons knew who he was. <laughs> And he would hush him. He would shut him up. My time's not to come. Be quiet. And you, of course, you probably don't want that kind of marketing uh, <laughs> by demonic voices, you know. <laughs> but at the same time, Jesus would say, and he would tell people that he healed, um, you know, keep this to yourself because my time had not yet come. So Jesus was not out there with great placards. Um, you know, he was not a road show mm -hmm. saying, uh, you know, come see the son of God who is uh, made manifest, who's come to, you know, the, mm -hmm. it, it was progressively revealed and revealed. And that's what John does again in his gospel. These eight signs, many other signs he said I could have used, but I've included these specific and, and we're having a gospel of John class um, in our BTC that just started uh, a week ago. It's the unfolding of who Jesus is, the revelation of him, so that progressively as it's unfolded, what's the final signs? His death and resurrection. Mm -hmm. It all builds towards that mm -hmm. so that you see this is the one who came and died and rose again. He is Messiah, the Son of God. In your sermon notes, unpack that as well of explaining in your point B, Jesus performs works which only God can do, forgives, right. resurrects gives eternal life, judges, creates, preserves all things. So you go down the list and those actions or even statements of saying your, your sins have been forgiven. Right. That's a big deal. That's and a lot of those are from Gospel of John. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, you, that's why, by the way, you often hear people say, um, if you're witnessing or sharing or even to a new believer, where Gospel do you start? John. Take them to the, tell them to read the Gospel of John. Because that unfolds progressively who this one is that says he came to give us life and life eternal, eternal life. Um, I, 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 I would, I like to challenge people who do not believe that Jesus is God or care to think about it. But even, even say, um, whether it's Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses or, or organizations is, okay, let's, let's, let's take your premise that he was just a created being, a mere being. 
How about going through the gospel, the, all, the 27 books of the New Testament, and just list and write out everything that it tells you about who this person is, Jesus. And, um, and then tell me afterwards, who do you think he is? Can a mere mortal do right, things? Right, right. What's, you, you know, that you just, yeah, you, you, you can't read yeah. everything that New Testament talks about Jesus and come away thinking that he was... A know, good man. Yeah, or, so, or a created <laughs> superstar of some sort. For those of us who do believe, how do we react? How do we respond? Again, because the head knowledge is one thing. Yeah. But then part of this series is meant to invoke is this passion for beholding him and not just learning new things and not just having apologetic knowledge to debate. Right. But how do we internalize this and just, just appreciate who he is and how that then allows us to live our lives? What how, Again, I just want to keep going back to this idea yeah. of beholding and, and how does understanding the deity of Christ, how does understanding he is the true son of God, how does that impact our lives? Yeah. And, and, and there's different ways we could approach that. Um, one is, is to, to realize that the moment we trust him as our savior, the scriptures make it clear, he takes up resonance in our life. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Um, and of course, that's through the power of the, the Holy Spirit. Um, but, but you take that fact and that truth of our radical transformation because of his presence within us. If he's God, the powerful, eternal Lord of the universe, um, wh why then do I stress over the things of life? Why do how, how, it, it should cause us to see life differently, the circumstances of life differently. And I made a comment in one of the mess sermons, maybe all three of them, but all four of them. But I, it was it, it was we're so easily prone to give Jesus a head nod. Hmm. You know, um, Tim Sanford and I were talking as he's preparing for his sermon coming up in a couple of weeks. Tim was making the comment how we can so easily glance Godward, but then gaze at our mm -hmm. our our life and mm -hmm. our situation. It's so we do the head nod mm -hmm. to Jesus, but then get back to what really is facing, what we're really facing. So the the reality of of Christ's deity and his presence within us in our lives, if if that was more central and more focused. I think it would totally change our outlook, our per perception of things. That I really went, I really can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's what Paul said. He believed in the deity of Christ. Jesus said in John 15, without me, you can do nothing. So Paul said, I can do all things. He took him at his word. And if it, that was just a mere man saying that, it would be meaningless. I mentioned Sunday, all bets are off. If if Jesus is not God, then everything he said, lo, I'm with you always. I've overcome the world. I'm coming again. All those things would be meaningless. So I think in a very practical sense, the deity of Christ is so crucial um, in how we live our daily life. Just as crucial as in the Old Testament, the Old Testament believers the Jeremiah's and Isaiah's and Daniel's and David's, their personal relationship with Jehovah God. You read through the Psalms and Daniel, there was just, you know, Jehovah God is my shield, my buckler. He, he is my strength. You know, Isaiah, you know, talked about um, Isaiah 41.10, when God, Jehovah says, call upon me, I'll answer you in your day of trouble. You know, I, I will be with you. That was comforting for Isaiah. Well, that God of the Old Testament is also the God of the New Testament in the person of Jesus, the second person of the unified Trinitarian God. So we can go to him just as Daniel, the richness of a relationship to see Psalm chapter three. David is, is people were saying of, of David, there is no hope for him. Many have risen against me. Many are saying there's no hope for him, God. 
but thou, O Lord, art my shield, mm. my strength. And I laid down and I slept and I awoke for the Lord sustains me. He was connected with the fact that um, he, he could handle it. I, I, um, Elijah, when Ahab, the wicked king Ahab and Jezebel are reigning, you know, supreme in, in, in Israel and all the followers of Jehovah are cowering in fear and Elijah stands firm and goes before the prophets of Baal who are under the control. He said, you know, pour your, you know, get your, uh, f your um, sacrifices and call upon your God to burn them up. Well, then he goes, remember, and he pours the water on all the altars and, and is running over. Why, why would you do that? Kind of, you know, like Elijah, come on, you know, cut some slack here. Why are you doing that? Because it's absolutely confident that one plus Jehovah God is a distinct majority. <laughs> and all the prophets of Baal were, you know. So this sense of the deity of Christ and this renewed thinking about that and maybe a refreshed perspective of that, I think, should give us confidence and boldness hmm. because truly one plus Jesus is a distinct majority, no matter what or who we face in life. Hmm. And there are believers down through the century who've gone, you know, before, um, you know, the firing squads, the gallows before the executioners block, like the apostle Paul and Peter and all down through the centuries with boldness and confidence. Why? Because Jesus was who he claimed to be. And if he wasn't, if he was a mere man, then it's that utter stupidity to give your life hmm. for, mm -hmm. for a fabrication. Well, and I think, um, just as an aside, you're making me think back to our study in Acts. And when we were getting ready to study Acts and just this thought that if this was not truth, if how could 12, I read the introduction to a commentary on Acts and in the introduction to the commentary, it said, how could 12 not highly educated men change the entire world and bring about the triumph of the gospel of Jesus Christ if it was not truth. Yeah. And if God was not blessing their efforts and allowing this to take over the world, because there's just too many. There's this Confucianism and this philosophy and that philosophy. And but the gospel is the one that's triumphing. And yeah. it would die over off. and over and over again. It's, it would it, die yeah. off. It, it is not dying off. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. God is alive. Yeah. And Jesus is real. And those people who have died for their faith have complete confidence yeah. that they will see him again. And there's that hope. And I think another practical thing that this should all should call us to as believers, this idea of the deity of Christ and the humanity of Christ, but everything about Christ is in our conversations with unsaved people is to begin, is to point them to who Jesus is. Um, we, 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 we have to be careful that we don't get derailed talking about evolution or political agendas or homosexuality and transgenderism is in the evils of this and that and the other thing and whatnot that the world just forget that people need to know mm. it's about Jesus. Mm -hmm. Who do you say that I am? Mm -hmm. And every person living and who has ever lived uh, needs to be confronted with that question. Because in the final analysis, it's what you do with Jesus that matters. All those other questions may be important, but they'll all be dealt with later. But right now, the most important thing is, who is Jesus? Whose son is he? Who, who do you think he is? And that's where we need to drive the conversations mm -hmm. to. And I think it's kind of interesting. I am. Um, I had breakfast with a distant relative this past Saturday, and she was uh, sharing, She, uh, we were talking about um, some other relatives that we haven't seen for a long time. And I, I said something about Jesus and um, their relationship with Jesus. And she kind of looked at me with, with really like big eyes, because I'm not sure that that thought had ever mm. occurred to her, that it's 
It's very possible for you to go to church every Sunday. It's very possible for you to, to live in the United States of America and dot all the I's and cross all the T's and have the you know values that you think are best, but to not really know what you think about Jesus and who Jesus is. Right. And I think that was like news to her as someone, she, she's recently become very serious about her faith, but I was asking her about Jesus and these extended relatives. And I think it kind of surprised her, mm -hmm. this idea idea that if if they don't if they don't call upon the name of Jesus then yeah yeah know. and, and the, another implication of that is keep thinking about that who's Jesus and, and and one other implication is if he is God and all authority all power all these things omnip all all resides within him there should be a sense within us of you know what um, as Paul wrote, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Therefore, the most important thing that I can do with my life is glorify him mm -hmm. because he is God. Mm -hmm. I'm not. And so there should be, and it's appropriate to disciple people to the sense of the Lordship of, of, of Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. He is God supreme. And, um, as such, he deserves and requires our total devotion. And uh, now he he woos us and he 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 brings us along in his grace and his love and his mercy to that. But at some point, like Thomas said, I like I said, I think Thomas, the disciple, was he was a believer. He, he didn't become saved that time in, in the upper room where he touched Jesus' nail prints hands. He was saved. It was this r renewed awakening. Mm. My Lord and my God. Yeah. And that should... And then it goes, you know, and that that's why I think this series becomes so important, Mark, because it does return to that. Like, we have to be reminded, unfortunately, you know, that I last time, last week I was here telling you guys about the splinter in my hand. The splinter mm -hmm. can distract me mm -hmm. from who Christ is and bringing glory to Christ. And I can become all obsessed with my splinter and not even give Christ a second thought, yeah. you know? And yeah. so that constant having him in front of us, gazing on him in his word, um, you know, thinking about him as we stand up and sit down and lie down. And as the Old Testament says, you know, writing it on our doorposts yeah. and on our foreheads. And, and I think as we partake of the Lord's table every week, mm -hmm. um, that specifically do this in remembrance of me. I gave my body, shed my blood, broke my body for you. So, you know, that's specific. But as we partake and as we're building on these themes, let's consciously and also engage with this is the one who was the pre-existent God. This is the one who was the great um, angel of the Lord who wrestled with Jacob. This is the, the pre-incarnate. This is the one who bodily entered a virgin's womb uh, for the purpose. This is the one who, you know, and we, we go, as we go through these, it's this whole wonderful panoramic view of mm -hmm. Jesus that as we partake, remember me uh, and all that I am and all that I've given for you. Um, and if we consciously do that, and you know, I had someone remind me uh, this last week and my son, in fact, it was who said, you know, dad, there are people who um, may not even want, or they're so caught up in life and the cares of life. They, they don't even know how, and they might not even care to focus on Jesus. And his point was, so at least invite them to ask Jesus to make them care. Hmm. Lord, I'll be honest with you. I don't care right now. I'm, I'm all caught up in this issue right now. And I'm glancing at you. And quite frankly, that's maybe all I can do right now. But help me to do more than glance. Hmm. And you call upon him. And, you know, we can preach your heart out. We can construct worship services and communion services to always to focus on Christ. The last song of, of behold him, the new song of, you know, it's a, it's a call to do that. But sometimes for some people, it may just have to start by saying, you know, I don't even want to. So help me want to. And let that be our prayer and let that as be a church, yeah, you right. know, to, to have that daily confrontation with Jesus yeah. and that man, 
And he will meet us. Yep. He will. Yep. Well, this is just scratching the surface. Yeah. I'm excited. I'm excited. This is good conversations. And hopefully you guys watching and listening are having that daily um, interaction with Christ. Have those times um, on your own and have those conversations where you can engage in discipleship with one another. And then when we gather back together on Sunday, Saturdays or Sundays, we get a chance to have renewed energy to worship the creator of the universe. And then we keep doing that time after time because we forget and we need reminders. So Rose and Mark, thank you so much for mm -hmm. being here today. Thank you. We're going to be at it again next week too. I'm excited. And uh, just for what it's worth, also be reminded of the other podcast that we have at FBC. Last week, Rose, you chatted with McManagles. Yeah, it was a really good, good, good conversation. So, so be on the lookout I, for I that. Recommend it. Yep, I even go. got an email from... John Morrison about that conversation. Mm, nice. So I'll just say, yeah, mm -hmm. it so was a good conversation. Listen to that this coming week. It will be a Fellowship Family release of a new episode. So look for that as well. Um, and just a couple things coming up in the church's life on the first Sunday of October, October 6th, there's going to be another Fellowship Family meeting, otherwise known as a congregational meeting. So get a chance to see what's going on in the life of our church, the ministries, and what God is doing through that. So Mark, come I'm look out for that. I'm here to interrupt you, yep. but because you said the first Sunday in October, just mm -hmm. in case there's any parents listening, just a reminder, beginning the first Sunday in October, yep. the kids are going to worship with us, mm -hmm. which means the kids are going to actually be invited to participate in communion. So I'll just plug, if you weren't able to come to the um, to the lunch they had for the, mm -hmm. children, for the children's ministry, um, Mike Lukens has created a really great resource source to talk to your kids about what communion is mm. and what it means. And so you might just as a yep. family want to kind of engage with that resource before the first Sunday in October. But yep. then they'll be released at the sermon time. Yeah, don't yes. worry. They, they no, won't don't be, worry. Right. Don't be screaming. No, no, no. no <laughs> kids around for the sermon. Yep. Yeah. No, they will. So engaging in, in song, engaging in communion, right. in that prayer, and then before the sermon, they'll get released yep. back to their Low, and that'll be area. the first Sunday of October. And again, the first Sunday of November. Correct. And the and first December, Sunday of December. And yeah. January and, and February and March. Yeah. <laughs> really focusing on <laughs> yeah. that. Exactly. Family worship time. So that'll be neat. Good. And just talking about parents, the Parent Summit will be on Friday, October 18th. So if you have not registered for that as well, there will be children's ministry available for kids. So both parents can attend. So sign up for that. Register is just a small fee for Mark, dinner. Mark, are you, are you watching you kids go. that night? Well, I was asked to uh, uh -huh. yesterday, so gotcha. we did it last year. Yep. I, I watched probably. kids last year too, yeah. and that's not my usual area. It was such a great blessing yeah. to me to get to know the kids a little bit. So we're planning on it. It's an yep. opportunity. Yeah. Just if, you, if you're not a direct parent, which is what that target audience is, you can serve in that yep. way. So um, that's just a couple things going on in the life of the church. And just obviously go to the website for all other details. So... The fact of the matter, guys, is that sermons are not meant just to take an hour, but rather transform a lifetime. Until next week, much love and God bless.